well, uh, actually what we've been discussing can be formulated as following. Uh, let's take, uh, we say that uh, we describe, say, both the gas by creation annihilation operator, and then we say uh, that the only relevant thing uh, is, uh, is, is the phase, in the sense that uh, soft excitations, uh, gapless excitations, come only from the uh, phase variations. And so we can formulate the low energy Lagrangian, the effective Lagrangian, which is extremely simple and, uh, uh, at the first glance. And we can actually write down the Euclidean action, or in statistical interpretation, the energy of the system uh, as uh, just one half uh, d mu by changing units. It's just a free field. And uh, the functional integral is integral d phi e to the minus beta s. Um, I'm just reminding you. Now, the basic point which we found was that, um, well, the uh, superfluidity or lack of superfluidity uh, is actually extremely also quite simple to understand. I'm saying all this because next step will be direct generalization will be quark confinement. So it is worth to put things in, to, to repeat these things. Um, so uh, we have to integrate, we, we, if we have moving walls, actually we looked look at the system um, when we go to a different frame. What does that mean, different frame? It means that you uh, start uh, moving uh, walls uh, in some direction, and then uh, you have to find uh, that uh, if, we are, if we have superfluid, this, the, the fluid itself uh, doesn't, doesn't change the state. So it's the reaction, since the, in terms of psi, the Galilean transformation is this. Uh, it's basically we are looking for the reaction uh, when we integrate with uh, phi as x goes infinity tends to some vx. And uh, the dependence on V actually defines uh, whether we are uh, in superfluid phase or in, in the normal phase. And uh, as, you, as you will see, it's, it would be, if it was not for vertices, for, for vortices, then, uh, 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 then uh, it would be a completely trivial problem, and we will find the whole thing always in the superfluid state. But uh, 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 the important thing about vortices I, it's, is this. I will put it in a slightly different form uh, than I did. Uh, so we said that it is possible that uh, the action is not infinite if uh, phi Generally speaking, let me start again. Generally speaking, if I experience a jump, uh, the action is infinite uh, because you have derivatives here, you have square, and so on. But uh, we uh, say that there is a certain uh, memory about where it comes from, um, which allows us uh, with impunity to have uh, discontinuities, we wrote it down like that. Which are basically the phase vortices with the phases. Uh, and 
I shall write it down also in a slightly different way. Let's suppose that we introduce a field B mu, which is D mu phi. Um, basically, we have uh, the equation which for a given B mu, uh, in order to be expressed on this form, it should be zero. Uh, and um, this actually is the beginning of several things. For example, now you take the field B mu and you form uh, US, uh, 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 su suppose, excuse me, uh, suppose you have uh, the field F mu nu now. The, what would be the analog of this equation? Uh, this equation tells you that uh, vector field is expressible in terms of uh, scalar field, it is a gradient. What would be the analogous equation uh, for uh, if you have anti-symmetric tensor field? Yes, we actually need to be, uh, it's what is called the second Maxwell equation. And more generally, if you have this plus cycles uh, is zero. And if this is satisfied, then lo at least locally you can express um, F mu nu as d mu b nu minus d nu b nu. And clearly it goes on and on for higher anti-symmetric tensors. And that's, I, I will of course not go into that, but that's the basis of cohomology theory in topology um, called Poincare lemma. And it's also called uh, in relativity, it's called Bianchi identity, and uh, it, it is also related to Jacobi identity. So it's, uh, it has many names, but uh, the reason I'm starting with this is that uh, vortices break down uh, Bianchi identity, these identities. Namely, if you now calculate you will find that uh, it is actually equal to epsilon mu nu q sum q a delta function of x minus x a. Um, so vortices are actually um, that uh, to some extent explains my remark uh, which the last time, which may be not uh, very clear, uh, have not been very clear, which is that, um, in a sense, vortices can imitate the gauge field. And that's still a slightly unclear question. Namely, uh, when you have uh, many vortices, uh, the, ga the gauge field is independent field B mu. Uh, when you have many vortices, uh, then, uh, Mm -hmm. You can basically have uh, a, a uniform dense. You can, in a sense, replace it by uniform density, and then uh, you probably can imitate any gauge field. So, you, if so, it would give you a possibility to build models uh, of gauge fields without gauge fields, in a sense. But that's a side remark. Um, what is important is that this thing is uh, broken. Uh, and another important thing is that when you, uh, it's, uh, things basically boils down to the fact that if you have this functional integral, you must, uh, the, it's approximately equal in the low energy sense, it's equal to the contribution of vortices. Vortices are, uh, they, they, they minimize uh, the effective action. And uh, as a result, we uh, discussed it last time, we have um, 
integral there is some uh, chemical potential uh, for the vortices I, I shall write down the formula and uh, will e to the minus beta sum Uh, so, you basically um, replace, the, 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 that's kind of interesting because uh, you have no such thing, uh, of, of vortex becomes a new degree of freedom out of nowhere. You, you, you had original degrees of freedom phi and the Gaussian integral is trivial, but you have all these, all these uh, subtle points. Uh, coming from multi-vortex configurations. And you are obliged uh, to, uh, to take them into account. And they uh, actually, dis uh, well, they destroy, at, at, uh, I, I shall not go into this, but if uh, beta is, there is a critical beta, is, if beta is small enough, then uh, vortices gets created freely. If beta is large enough, uh, they are they form a vortex molecules there. Uh, we will actually see. Uh, I will not spend time on on vortices because we are interested in confinement, where the situation is similar, but uh, the physics. Uh, uh, well, uh, we will discuss discuss it in connection with confinement. Confinement is basically the same model. You see, you can build um, various models of low energy behavior, uh, and uh, they will uh, actually describe different phases. <coughs> so, uh, now let's. Uh, Uh, the what? Where is the vector field? Oh, there is no vector field here. It's uh, this theory. Yeah. You can write, if you want to, you can say that the vector field, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, did, 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 did I erase it? Uh, yeah, I shall write it down once again. It's a nice formula that uh, the this is the uh, Bianchi identity and would be zero if it's equal to QA delta function of x minus xA. That, by the way, is precisely the formula of hydrodynamics. If B is identified with the velocity, then the right-hand side is called vorticity. And you can solve it and find that B mu is epsilon. Here is epsilon mu nu epsilon mu nu x uh, minus x a nu x minus x a square. Um, and this is the, if you have uh, ideal fluid, incompressible fluid, uh, then uh, you can form uh, by, when you have any torque in the fluid, uh, it generates uh, vorticity and uh, velocity. The velocity is uh, distributed just like that. So it is mm, mm, about this vector field, and the mm, basically uh, the action, the effective action is b mu plus a mu external. Here, here it is in two dimensions, right? Yeah, yeah, and I will go to three in a moment, but at this, uh, at, uh, right now it's two dimensions. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, so, and when we study the reaction uh, to, with respect to external field, we have to calculate the integral over b mu or over phi, uh, and it has this simple form. And now you see, you see what's happening. 
uh, if B mu, if there are no vortices, then uh, transverse, uh, we can split a mu external onto transverse and longitudinal parts, right? And uh, what will happen without vortices? If, suppose that we a mu external were a mu external perpendicular plus a mu external parallel, meaning that this, if you take the divergence, d mu a mu is zero here, and this is proportional to d mu. So you always can split uh, any vector field like that. Now, what would be the, um, without particity, uh, what would be the answer if you uh, calculate the, either minimize or calculate the Gaussian integral of phi? Exactly, because uh, when you integrate over B mu, B mu will be purely longitudinal, and uh, you can, it will eat, it will eat uh, this, this, this term. Mm -hmm. And this, this A perpendicular is what is characteristic for, for the superfluid phase. Now, what is characteristic for the normal phase uh, is that adding, is that not only perpendicular part is eaten, but also, uh, not only, excuse me, parallel part is eaten, but also the perpendicular part, the transverse part. Uh, how, how would you explain this eating of the transverse part? So my claim is that if beta, uh, where, where that was, if beta is uh, small enough, high temperature, you get normal fluid. Uh, and in this case, this, the answer is simply independent, independent uh, of uh, a mu external. Uh, how would you uh, give me some intuitive explanation of this? Uh, well, uh, uh, to uh, try to think in terms of the uh, uh, of this equation, which is so to say anomalous uh, beyond k identity. Um, you see, it gives you perpendicular part. Uh, th the right-hand side is essentially perpendicular part of B. V vortices, okay, let's, let's start again. Uh, we said that uh, without vortices, uh, B is the gradient of phi, so it, is, it can cancel A mu parallel, but it cannot change A mu perpendicular, okay? Um, now, uh, now we add vorticity. This time, B mu acquires a perpendicular part because of the right hand side. And when, uh, and when uh, vortices are uh, present, and there are many of them, uh, they can actually obliterate this perpendicular part. There are, you get, instead of discrete vortices, you get kind of a complete, uh, of a continuous distribution. Um, and that you see, uh, I will, we will see something more general in a moment, so I will not do it here. But uh, it's all the properties of this, uh, it's basically plasma of uh, two-dimensional charges, what we have here with Coulomb interaction. And because of long-range forces, because of this, uh, you have uh, actually at, at large beta, you have charges are confined by this logarithmic potential in this plasma, so they form dipoles, and then these dipoles decay. Now, now let's uh, go to um, uh, uh, for confinement, I will say a few general words, and then we return to the formulas, which will be basically 
the same formulas as we have here. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, just the step towards quark, quark confinement is just the step from here to uh, uh, to the next uh, to the to the higher dimensional tensor the tensor with high dimen uh, well the tensor with more indices um, uh, why is that and let's Mm. Well, mm, the, first of all, what, what is the problem? Why it's called the problem of quark confinement? We know that uh, quarks uh, interact uh, with uh, gauge fields, with gluons, and mm, those uh, we, we never see it, we believe. Uh, into the following picture, that when we have a when we have electrodynamics and you have two charges, um, then uh, the Faraday lines of force are spread out uh, to the whole space, and as a result, uh, in the Electrodynamics, we get a we get Coulomb interaction. Uh, we have uh, the Gauss theorem, which tells us that the flux is equal to the charge, but this flux uh, spreads out. It's energetically favorable for it to spread out. Now, so this is electro electromagnetism. Uh, in case of QCD. Uh, is, uh, what happens is that, that and that we will derive this actually, that the vacuum uh, squeezes uh, the uh, quantum effects uh, generate uh, if it polarizes the media so that it is the extremum, the, the most probable configuration will be not like that, but the configuration then all flux will go through the single well it, strictly speaking can fluctuate but it will be kind of an open string uh, formed out of the um, out of the electric flux once again the Gauss theorem is uh, true in non-abelian case as well so the total charge uh, will define the, the amount of electric flux in this thing. But it's clear that um, we will have just the um, linear, dip the, instead of the Coulomb potential, effective energy will be proportional to R and not 1 over R like in this picture, just the length of the string. This is like one-dimensional Coulomb potential. Actually, I, let's uh, remember it will be helpful to resolve the following puzzle. Uh, take uh, one plus one-dimensional electromagnetism. Then take two charges here and here. Then there is Coulomb potential, which is <coughs> Uh, linear and instantaneous. In normal, in the four-dimensional case, we know that we have instantaneous, uh, 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 first of all, in the normal case, in the usual 3 plus 1 electrodynamics, if you have, uh, if you <coughs> Uh, uh, have uh, Coulomb interaction, which is instantaneous, how it is compatible with uh, special relativity, which tells us that uh, things cannot be instantaneous. Just in ordinary standard uh, textbook electrodynamics. 
you always can write it down. Uh, so you have, say, two particles scattering. And how would you explain that Coulomb interaction doesn't violate relativity in this case? Coulomb interaction is essentially represents Well, it's a field of what? Mm. I, I want to say the diagrams are usually written in terms of um, essentially. Um, uh, I forgot longitudinal versus yes. the, uh, transverse. the transverse uh, degrees of freedom of the of the photon. Okay. So the, the, the dynamical ones mm -hmm. are, are the transverse, and uh, mm -hmm. essentially the quantization pro procedure. Can, can be done in terms of the transverse part. But, uh, so in, that, in the language of diagrams, the, the longitudinal part and the A0 part uh, cancel out each other. Uh, so that's basically correct, yes. Uh, let me explain this very simple way. Yeah. Suppose we have two currents, they interact. Uh, mm, uh, the interaction is, uh, you, you can you have J mu, the propagator uh, J nu and uh, now if you write down uh, J0 um, J0 uh, minus J1 J1 divided by omega square minus K square that's the amplitude um, and let's suppose k is directed uh, along the z-axis. Now let's, uh, and I even write, yeah, I, I, I should write it like that, like this, minus j perpendicular, j perpendicular. So k is in one direction. Now see, uh, now, I, now I'm giving you the argument, uh, which is the following. Let's uh, use conservation of current omega j0 is equal to kj1. You see what happens then uh, is that um, you substitute j0, j0, uh, 1 minus k square divided by omega square minus j perpendicular, j perpendicular divided by omega square minus k square. Now see what's happening. Uh, so here should be actually omega square divided by k square. Uh, see what's happening. You have j perpendicular, j perpendicular with a minus omega square minus k square. This is exchange of the transverse photons, physical photons. Uh, uh, plus j naught, j naught. And now this uh, propagator, which corresponds to retarded or advanced uh, green function, it cancels away. We have uh, just k square, which means no omega dependence, which means that the whole thing uh, is actually instantaneous. J0, J0 is instantaneous, but it is compensated by the exchange of the mm, since the original expression was relativistically invariant, it remains invariant, and you, the non-invariances of, in, of, of the Coulomb is compensated uh, by the uh, transverse photon. By, but so far, so good. That's more or less standard electrodynamics. But now I'm going to say something less standard. Um, it's a good, by the way, to know this decomposition. Same thing works for gravitons and so on. You get instantaneous Newton plus transverse gravitons, so on. Uh, okay, now, now let's go to, uh, we know that the fo here we have d minus two, uh, d minus two uh, uh, components. Um, and that's the number of physical photons. Let's take d equals two. Then we have uh, well, then we have really a puzzle. 
this part is not really a puzzle, but now we have a puzzle that um, you have linear interaction between this thing. Coulomb is linear. Uh, um, and it's instantaneous, and there are no photons. The puzzle is that there are no transverse photons. The question is, um, uh, how, how about relativity? And this question has a good and interesting answer and simple. Do we see the question, first of all? That uh, the question is that uh, we, we, when we do this transformation, we don't have this thing because we, there are no perpendicular directions. So we have only Coulomb interaction. Fourier transform of this gives you linear potential. dk over k square gives a linear uh, Coulomb potential. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Uh, for uh, I claim, and you, I want you to figure out why, uh, that uh, when the energy is proportional to the distance uh, and instantaneous, it doesn't contradict uh, special relativity. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the thing is, uh, special relativity tells you that uh, you can send signals uh, fast, uh, uh, faster than light, right? Now let's try to send a signal. Uh, uh, for that we will uh, move, suppose we, uh, we want to communicate the person here wants to communicate the person here, and it, this, this guy measures electric force uh, which acts on it, which is, what is the electric force? Uh, just a constant. Now, when this guy starts uh, moving this charge, hoping to reach this one, this one doesn't, doesn't feel anything, uh, because the force, it was a constant, it remains a constant. You see? Uh, so it's curious that string, uh, any, by the way, any other law, if it is not linear, but say r to the three halves, then that's a catastrophe because it's, it, it will immediately, um, you, you will be able to instantaneously send signals. Mm, so that's how it is, and that's why strings are so, spe the generalization of this is that. Uh, Strings, uh, in general, they, uh, they, they are consistent with uh, uh, relativity in spite of some instantaneous interactions which are, uh, which are present. Okay. It seems curious that one can, in general, modify the Coulomb law, say. One could imagine R to the different power generated by different interactions. I mean, by additional interactions. And you will be severely punished for that. <laughs> no, I mean in 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 QED. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, it, it could violate because if the total flux should be still. Like uh, you will. Um, either there's uh, the only thing which you can do is uh, to say that uh, we add degrees of freedom, yeah. uh, some degrees of freedom, then uh, things uh, th then uh, things will not be instantaneous anymore. When you, you will be able to trans transfer, transmit information through by exciting these degrees of freedom, and then they will propagate with some velocity less than. Velocity of light. That happens in strings, actually. You don't, 
you have only in some limit you have this uh, linear law, but when the string oscillates, you send the signal, but with finite velocity. Um, okay, but I have an uh, interesting thing is that all these strings, they are the consequence of very similar uh, setup which we did uh, with, uh, which we did there. <coughs> And, um, yeah, maybe one thing which I want you to remember about the, uh, you probably remember this anyway, that uh, we have in, with case of vortices, we simply can define a for a given configuration of phi x, uh, phi x, each phi x lies between 2 pi and 0, uh, uh, ah, consider this as a homework. Uh, suppose uh, you are given phi x. How to determine uh, what are vorticities related to this phi x? So you have uh, uh, you have. Uh, so just imagine, I, I'll tell you, I'll list you all, all these angles. You have rotators at each side. And each rotator is characterized uh, by, by, by this phase. And we say that there are certain, uh, for the, well, it's obvious that there is a state without vorticity. That's all phi x are the same. If you take all phi x equal to zero, for example, it's clearly there, are, there is no vorticity. But uh, if you, on the other hand, if you have something like that, intuitively it's clear that there is vorticity. Uh, but uh, how to define it? I'll give you a hint how to define it, but uh, you will. Uh, well, but. Uh, well, it's not very clear what it means. Actually, I'll tell you the idea, and then you you'll work out. Let's take two uh, two neighboring phi's, and um, then define the integer so that. Two neighboring, without this, two neighboring phi's can be greater than, the difference may be greater than pi. Now let's add the integer, which uh, is really, which depends on the lattice, in such a way that this is pi. So you find uh, for each configuration, you can, you, n is actually plus or minus one or zero. Um, bec it's because phi can become, uh, one phi can be close, uh, say, to two pi, uh, this close to zero, and we want the whole thing less than, than pi. Um, so you automatically ascribe to each configuration the set of integers. And uh, when you take the circulation of this set of integers around the plaquette, and, and those integers are associated with links, as you see. Um, uh, then you have, uh, if you have a vortex here, it means that uh, a link, the, the links crossed by this tail uh, have n equals 1. So uh, try to work out several examples to understand this. Mm. And all this, but uh, I, I'm mentioning it this in passing because uh, we can do without it with just uh, um, using this uh, continuous functional integral, etc. But in fact, to get uh, at least I can tell you about. I, I understood things uh, completely only when I 
had this precise uh, definition and work out a few examples. Um, now, uh, we can do the same thing uh, in, the, in case of uh, gauge theories. And the first, um, the first example of gauge theory is, uh, which we looked at, is the so-called uh, on a lattice, it's uh, what is called compact electrodynamics. It's electrodynamics for which vector potential is an angular variable. And as you will see, the flux lines indeed form a string. So our plan will be to work out this string. And then, uh, on the next lectures, we will uh, see how to describe these strings in terms of string theory. Uh, so what I'm saying, maybe I shall spend a minute for, basic, for general philosophy, uh, uh, the, ph the philosophy is like that, that we have two descriptions of gauge theory, uh, of especially of non-abelian gauge theory describing quarks and their interaction. Uh, two descriptions. One can be called uh, the Maxwell descriptions, in which case you describe uh, things uh, using vector potentials and field strengths. And the other can be called the Faraday descriptions. In Faraday dealt directly with flux lines, with lines of force, as he called it. Uh, and in, in the non-abelian vacuum, the lines of force become dynamical. And you can, so one expects that uh, there, is, there are two dual descriptions of the same thing. One uh, is using fields, and the other is using strings. And it turns out to be true um, with one curious addition that this effective string uh, if we want to describe four-dimensional gauge theory, the effective string must live in five dimensions, not in four. Um, and that, that I will explain why later. At the moment, we want to see at least some simplest example where the string is formed. And this simplest example is this compact QED. <coughs> it's basically the same, uh, the same game as, as here. We start with phi x here, and then uh, got vortices, etc. And we had, uh, on a lattice, mm, we have uh, the energy or the action, which was some cosine phi x minus phi x plus delta. It's, it's O2 version of the Ising model. In Ising model, we have Z2 symmetry. Here we have O2. Um, and uh, we then said uh, that uh, we can replace, forget the cosine, replace it by gradient of phi square, but phi must be multivalued. And that's vorticity. So that was basically all I was discussing the last two lectures. It boils down to this. Uh, now, let's do similar thing, but uh, one dimension higher. Uh, namely, let's assume that we have a variables which are associated with links, like these integers. But this time it's not integers, it's just independent variables. We call, we call them A x delta, which will become vector potential at the end. But at the moment, it's just angular variables, again, uh, restricted between um, uh, 2 pi and 0. And uh, 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 AX delta is uh, actually um, 
we have gauge invariance. We want to have gauge invariance phi x bar delta minus phi x. So we want the theory to be invariant under this transformation. Uh, and uh, it's very easy to, to, to do this. Uh, we, we can just introduce the field strength, which is a circulation around the plaquette. So explicitly it's Ax alpha apply Ax plus beta alpha minus Ax plus alpha beta minus Ax beta. And uh, you see immediately that uh, when you perform uh, this gauge transformation, uh, the, this thing doesn't change. And we again assume that uh, in order to avoid uh, various discontinuities at 2 pi, that the effective energy is uh, simply minus sum cosine of, in fact, any periodic function. You see, we introduce the lattice, but only to remove it at the next step. Uh, we introduce the lattice in superfluidity and uh, we said that, okay, it gives us some micro definition, but no one thinks that there's really a, a, a lattice in helium-4. There's no such thing there. It's just to define a theory. But then we go to the um, low energy limit, and the memory about the Mm -hmm. about the microscopic model is the fact that the phase is multivalued and therefore we need vortices. Here we also will go to to the standard Maxwell action but there is there will be a certain uh, 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 from from the microscopic point of view, there will be certain additional condition that some singularities are allowed, like jumps by two pi. Uh, and notice how interesting it is. If we could uh, say could put here um, a non non periodic function, if we put here non periodic function. Uh, formal limit will be the same, but th the, these extra uh, configurations will be forbidden uh, with jumps. Uh, if we have this thing, we will see that there are magnetic monopoles uh, which, which are actually present in the system and which are just the direct analog of vortices in the lower dimensions. So that's what I, And a formation of strings is uh, tightly, is closely related to this uh, mono, magnetic monopoles. What's, what's the problem with formations? Uh, uh, we will come to this. Uh, it's not a problem, it's just that they, they give some different answer. Um, by the way, it's just like here, uh, I discussed uh, two-dimensional uh, superfluidity. You can ask, and what happens in higher dimensions? In higher dimensions, the answer is quite simple. Uh, in high, if you simply keep discussing uh, field phi in higher dimensions, um, instead of a point, in two dimensions, vortex was a point. Now it will be some one-dimensional object. And we will have, instead of this sum, we will have the sum over vortex rings. And uh, it, can be, it, it can easily be analyzed, and I will, I will tell you what, uh, what the outcome is. Like the whole strings? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Um, okay. <clears throat> so let's... Uh, see what kind of uh, configuration are allowed. 
as I said uh, before, we already um, know this. Um, if we take d alpha f beta gamma, d beta, I, I will keep calling it Bianchi identity, although it might be not a right. Uh, d beta f gamma alpha plus d gamma f alpha beta. That's the uh, it's you know that's about the names uh, attached to d different things. There is the famous uh, 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 theorem by Arnold, um, which says that uh, things are never called after the person who first invented them, and then the. Corollary, corollary to, this theory, to this theorem is that uh, this statement applies to the theorem itself. Mm. Anyway, it's, it's certainly not Bianchi Proud who first wrote it, but mm, it doesn't really matter much. Um, uh, so, uh, the, uh, we, we want the analog of this, we, we expect uh, that uh, there will be Saddle points uh, which break this uh, this relation, and uh, by the analogy, what what would you write? What would be the analog of this equation? Yeah, it's very natural generalization of this this guy. You see, if, uh, suppose we are in three dimensions, three D. Here we have two D. You still can make one dimensional. The what? You still can make word. Oh no, I'm. I'm. Uh, it's not what I'm asking. I'm asking. Suppose we have vortices in 2D, uh, are vortices are described by this equation. Uh, they generate vector field satisfying this equation. Uh, without vortices, it's pure gradient. Now, in 3D, we, we now do two things. First of all, we uh, say that instead of variable B mu, Typical for vortices, we, we uh, actually um, uh, go take the we promote it to the higher position. Now it's anti-symmetric tensor F mu, um, and we also simultaneously we go from 2D to 3D. Actually, because you, as you will see. Uh, anti-symmetric tensor in 3D, very much analogous to the vector in 2D. And it continues. Actually, in 4D, uh, the, there will be anti-symmetric tensor with four indices and so on. Um, so it's uh, very natural uh, gen set of generalizations. Mm. So I'm now returning to my question, which is what is the um, what is the nature of um, right hand side here? If it is zero, that means that uh, when it is zero, it means that f alpha beta is expressible as d alpha a beta minus d beta a alpha. That's what is called the Poincaré lemma. Uh, that uh, if you have this relation, then uh, so it should be epsilon alpha beta gamma multiple some charge. Yeah, charge uh, actually, yes, yes. It's uh, the answer is uh, just that uh, it's epsilon alpha beta gamma, and just as there we have Q a delta of x minus xa. Um, and to 
justify it. It's again the same story. You here we justify. Uh, again, I will take it. Uh, Uh, vortices. We said that we take two dimensions, we put wo the vortex in uh, like disorder parameter in the Ising model, we put it uh, at the center of the dual lattice and uh, at the center of the lattice of the plaquette. We attach a tail And we change, uh, we, we, we assume that uh, we have uh, these uh, integers nx delta uh, whenever the tail crosses the sink. As a result, we have uh, the total, if you integrate around the continuous limit, we get d mu phi dx mu, uh, it will be 2 pi multiplied by Q. And, uh, <clears throat> which is, that's B mu, and that's equivalent to this, uh, to this thing. Mm. I remind you the same thing we had in the Ising model, but it was Z2 symmetry. We simply flipped the sign of this coupling in, in the Ising model. Now, this thing, which is called monopoles, same thing. We have this time three-dimensional. We put the monopole uh, in uh, at the center of this cube, and we attach uh, attach the line, uh, which uh, arbitrary tail, whenever it crosses a plaquette the coupling uh, we uh, get the n x alpha beta coupling and uh, from this coupling we form the fl magnetic flux. I shall explain now it in a very simple way, although it's uh, in the continuous way. Actually the, the way Dirac first invented monopoles in this equation, we don't have the tail, right? Huh? In this equation, we don't have the tail. Uh, right, because this equation, uh, just, just, ju just notice, just as in the vortex case, uh, we also didn't have the tail, because uh, the tail cancels, this is a physical quantity, and so it's, uh, the the tail is needed uh, when you want to express b mu as d mu phi. Uh, I shall now explain it in a, it's, it's kind of important to understand these things, uh, so I shall explain it in a different way, in yet a different way. I think I will need this. Um, let's uh, forget about the lattice and work in purely in continuums. Uh, just as in case of vortices, uh, we simply could uh, say that the phase is multivalued. Here we can say the following. Um, generally, uh, we, since B, the magnetic field, is the curl of A, um, we know that in the standard electrodynamics, we, we, it, it follows then that if you take integral b d s, uh, then it should be equal to zero. Uh, however, we can how how to form monopole. Let's form not the monopole, but uh, basically imagine a magnet a magnetic solenoid, uh, which is very long, infinitely long, and um, you have magnetic charge here, for which uh, uh, the, 
B for magnetic charge is simply x divided by x cube. So that the divergence of B, here we have, this follows from the fact that divergence of B is zero. Here, divergence of B is not zero, it's like vorticity, which means that B cannot be, in this form, we, it, we cannot really use the standard Maxwell equation. But imagine uh, that uh, we have an infinite solenoid, infinitely thin solenoid, uh, such that the flux, magnetic flux uh, compensates this one. So um, you have uh, circulation around the solenoid um, equal to 2 pi. Um, and as a result, if you have, uh, when it pierces uh, the, uh, w w when we take this integral, it will, sell, it will be split onto two parts. Um, there will be the part uh, 4 pi um, Q magnetic coming from, from, from the flux. And you will compensate it uh, by the and so it will be still zero you can but you will have not a point like particle but the, you will have a particle with a tail and now comes a, an extremely interesting argument an important argument by Dirac um, which is he said that this, so far, it could be classical, classical electrodynamics. But it's not very interesting because it's some uh, clumsy uh, object with the tail. Dirac said the tail is invisible if it is quantized. And the argument, the argument is very simple. You have, uh, for, if you take an, uh, uh, say, uh, an electron going around this thing, um, the amplitude for the amplitude for an ele electron to go around contains e to the i charge, electric charge of the electron um, and so you see that if uh, if Q E uh, and A uh, is uh, um, if these are arbitrary, you will see uh, the change. The uh, electrons will will experience there will be a non-zero amplitude because of the presence of this uh, of, of, of this tail. But uh, if it is quantized, uh, then the phase doesn't change. When the, actually there was even, ex, uh, people even, af, long after Dirac, uh, people uh, asked the question, what is the, um, uh, influence of infinitely thin solenoid because uh, the interesting thing about this solenoid is that all magnetic flux is inside so there is no magnetic field outside. Nevertheless the amplitude is non-zero uh, without quantization and this is what is called the Aron of Bohm experiment. Uh, which tells you that uh, when you don't have quantization, if the flux is not quantized, you really can uh, see electron flies, and even though there's no magnetic field, it flies through the region without magnetic field. Nevertheless, it experiences uh, 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 non-zero, non-trivial amplitude. And, uh, but the, of course, the main achievement was this realization by Dirac that uh, quantization makes the tail invisible. It's 
as you see, the ta this tail is precise analog of this tail we had at the beginning with the disorder parameter. Um, okay, that's another way of seeing the same thing. So, uh, basically, for you to um, the thing which uh, I want you to understand is that these magnetic monopoles uh, are simply the, the the statement is very precise mathematical that if you uh, minimize this action and then go to continuous limit you will find those monopoles configuration there will be minima uh, for non-periodic thing you will find only trivial field for which f is zero for periodic you will find those magnetic monopoles okay and now the th th uh, there is also the third uh, way to view these monopoles, um, uh, which is the following. Mm. And by the way, by the way, Dirac uh, concluded that if there is a single uh, monopole. If, if there's a single monopole in the universe, then it forces uh, all electric charges to be quantized. <coughs> Actually, this is also important, uh, so let me uh, spend a few minutes about quantization of charges. Um, how uh, I claim that in the, first of all, what is quantization of charges? How would you define the statement that the charges are quantized? Each charge you could find in the universe equals a uh, singular number multiplied by something. Yeah, well, uh, it's uh, interesting, but you see, which uh, ba basically what, what, what you can say is that the ratio of charges of any two particles exactly. should be a rational number. Okay, good. Now, uh, Mm. Now let's try to figure out why uh, it's something to be expected, not from the Dirac argument, but uh, just when you have the effective energy or action, which is the sum of cosine f x alpha beta, and you want to add on the lattice uh, some field, some charged field. Uh, so this is epsilon 1. Now, how the charge field interacts. So suppose we have bosonic field, psi x, uh, which interacts with, uh, um, with the electromagnetic field. Uh, and we have, uh, in principle, we have psi x plus delta. Um, that's what replaces the plus complex conjugate. Um, uh, th then we have uh, under gauge transformation, you can you have gauge symmetry psi x e to the i alpha x psi x and simultaneous shift of a. So you actually have this gauge invariant expression. And now uh, so that, that's just uh, the standard construction. If you go, of course, if you go to the continuous limit, you will get a covariant derivative square. It will be just the standard covariant derivative. One derivative comes from, differentiation comes from expansion in delta, and the term proportional to A comes from the expansion uh, in A. Okay. Uh, and now I'm ready to ask you the question, why the charges must be quantized? If I have many fields, um, suppose now I have many different fields, uh, the claim is that for consistency you need quantization of these charges. Suppose you have the field psi, chi, uh, they interact somehow. And if the field has the charge Q, the, 
it, 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 it will be, it will contain it here. And now, uh, why Q must be integer, if we write it down this way? Q, it will be inconsistent. Uh, because we have symmetry. Uh, which, which one? We have many symmetries here. Uh, we, we have indeed periodicity. periodicity. We have periodicity. And in order to be period, if, if we break periodicity, we destroy the theory completely. There will be no magnetic monopoles immediately will acquire infinite energy. Uh, so, um, you see that um, this periodicity implies uh, that uh, the charges must be quantized. Uh, and they are. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, and that actually is a counterpart of the Dirac argument because Dirac argument assumed the presence of monopoles and we see that it's only periodicity of this action which, which is responsible for the monopoles. So it's not, it's very uh, nice that uh, in both ways we get, we come to the quantization condition. Okay, uh, now uh, one more thing about it. Uh, which is also needed, is that can we get uh, the same picture with uh, magnetic monopoles? By the way, these monopoles in the system which we are looking at at the moment, they are not yet uh, particles. Then it's a three-dimensional system and uh, in with Euclidean space-time and they are actually localized objects in, uh, in the three-dimensional space-time, uh, three-dimensional three Euclidean space-time. So uh, that's because of, the, since they are localized in time, they are called, that's, they belong to the general family of objects called instantons. So in this, in this context, monopoles, these magnetic monopoles are instantons. Instantons are simply the ex uh, extremal uh, points of the action. Um, and now uh, one more thing which we will need uh, is, which is another way to get quantization of charges and uh, magnetic poles. Um, uh, let's imagine we, we can obtain precisely the same low energy picture from the completely different uh, thing. Namely, so we take non-abelian theory uh, in which the, we have uh, gauge fields, we, ha we have field A mu and we have W bosons, photons, W bosons, and uh, you can, we, we shall denote it by some non abelian gauge field. The F mu nu, the Young Mills field strength, is d mu a nu minus d nu a nu plus vector product a mu a nu. And we introduce the Higgs field, which is a vector, isotopic vector, vector in this sense. So we, we have the action which is purely continuous. This time we are not considering uh, a lattice. Uh, we just say d mu phi plus a mu phi plus f mu nu square. Um, and we add some potential, some x-like potential which depend on phi square. And of course, uh, these terms, if you postulate that phi 3 is non-zero, if you choose the potential so that phi 3 is non-zero, it will give you the mass term uh, a mu plus, a mu minus, or I call it a mu, which are the mass of W bosons, 
uh, and the field A mu3 will remain massless. So in the low energy limit, uh, we will have um, we will have uh, massless fields. Now the claim is uh, that if you integrate out all massive modes and you will remain with the field A mu3, this field A mu3 uh, will be a compact field. Uh, the gauge theory described here is a compact gauge theory. So this field A mu3 will be uh, uh, will uh, uh, will have the prop will be described by the compact electrodynamics. Uh, how to see this? Well, why we should expect that it is compact? Or why this non-abelian thing uh, must be a compact object geometrically? What can you say about the Lie algebra? That actually is a wo wonderful mathematical fact that, that uh, if you have uh, semi-simple Lie algebra, they have always a compact version. And moreover, any compact uh, uh, algebra is semi-simple. Um, it is. It must be compact because uh, with if we have Lie algebra uh, with a Euclidean signature, uh, it is compact, and it we, we must have Euclidean signature because otherwise the kinetic energy will have the wrong sign, and we will have negative nor negative probabilities. Uh, so there is no way out from here except to admit that. Uh, this is a compact theory. Okay, I'm getting late, it seems. Um, not too late, but a little late. Um, and uh, we will uh, finish this next time. Let's stop here.